Welcome back, everybody. I hope, yeah, perfect it works. Uh, my name is Ruzsa I'm uh, the Vice Chair of the Hungarian Europe Society in the name of the... Uh, you don't hear me. Okay, so now this way? Yeah. Perfect. So my name is Ruzsa uh, I'm the Vice Chair of the Hungarian Europe Society and in the name of the organizers and sponsors, I would also like to thank you for uh, joining us today. We have a very exciting and interesting panel ahead of us dealing with uh, the question of uh, migration and populism and the nexus uh, between the two. Uh, as was previously mentioned uh, in the keynote speeches, when uh, we were talking about the Visegrad region in the mid-2000s, especially after the uh, Visegrad countries had joined the European Union, they were often mentioned as sort of Democracy's new champions, as uh, at the volume also uh, yes, uh, called these countries. Uh, but their reappearance on the European scene is actually portraying them in a very different light, as we all know. Um, two years ago, uh, the discourse and behavior of uh, the Visegrad group as such has uh, strongly started to undercut the narrative of democratic progress uh, Milada was uh, referring to uh, in her keynote speech. And uh, this was especially so in uh, their reaction uh, to the refugee and migration crisis, which has become a very symbolic as well as thematizing uh, issue over the past two years for the Visegrad group and for the European Union as such. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we have chosen uh, this topic for today's discussion. And one of the uh, important aspects of it, why we uh, want to focus on it, is that this has become a playground for mainstream parties' populist discourse. So whereas we have been seeing uh, extreme right, radical right talking about um, migration over the previous years in the European Union. In the Shepherd countries case now we see that uh, this topic has been taken up by the mainstream as such and is shaping the agenda, shaping the discourse in these countries and in fact uh, changing uh, hearts and minds of the people. So here we would like to also touch upon the supply side that uh, several of you have previously been mentioning. Um, the discourse and the activities of uh, the Visegrad countries, and here I think of the veto, or even more recently, the reaction of the Czech Republic by uh, suspending, taking, uh, relocating refugees, although uh, asylum seekers, or, uh, although they have uh, accepted the, the quota system, is uh, posing a threat to the unity of the European Union and also uh, by undercutting such values as human rights that we have taken for granted previously is also threatening the functioning of democracy in these states. Um, so in this panel, with our excellent speakers, we would like to uh, touch upon several questions. Um, first, we would like to discuss how the refugee and migration crisis and the instrumentalization of the refugee and migration crisis has impacted political language and discourse in the Visegrad countries, how it shaped the political agenda, and what motives and methods, as well as regional patterns we can observe in these countries. Uh, we also would like to see how the representation of the refugee and migration crisis uh, was shaping social perceptions. So here again, the supply side comes into play. But after moving, uh, or after discussing uh, a bit of this descriptive uh, state-of-the-art issue, uh, I would also like to ask our speakers to touch upon whether they see uh, lasting effects uh, of this discourse in the region, uh, in politics and in the society, or will this just fade if something else comes up? Has this altered our uh, thinking about um, democratic values and, and the functioning of the state. And I also would like to ask you to touch upon initiatives that you have seen rising countering the um, populist response to the refugee and migration crisis. Uh, and if you can maybe point out some uh, successful promising uh, 
cases, initiatives, which can address the politics of the refugee and migration crisis, the policy, and the social perception. Uh, so with this, uh, I would like to first pass the floor to Anna Vishwizi, who is Head of Research at the Institute of East Central Europe in Lublin, uh, who will introduce uh, us a little bit to the migration populism nexus in the case of Poland and Greece. So um, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. Thank you very much for, for this kind of invitation. Now, I've been to Budapest on several occasions, but never, never in this particular setting. And I'm very happy for this. Ishan is looking at me because he asked me to speak slowly. So <laughs> just if you if you if you hear this, speed up. Just just raise your hand, and I know that I, that I should. Um, so um, I basically come here with two hats because I, I live in Greece some parts of the year, and I also work in Poland, so I have an insight into it. And when we had a discussion on populism uh, with regard to migration, um, I, I thought, well, it's quite an interesting issue because we can see how the Greeks have dealt with the problem and how to use the lessons that they have applied in their country for the case of the visionary countries. Also, as an academic, I also think that um, that uh, the attempted that contextualization of problems that you face is always uh, a good thing. So, so this is exactly what happened. Let me see if I can work with this though. Um, this is technology, right? Oh, I just thought I should yeah. <laughs> right, my friend. So um, I believe in order to be able to address the um, migration populism nexus, which is the most problematic issue that we are discussing today, it's very important to see what are the mechanisms that drive it. And certainly, as for Congo, you need to dance it, the same happens with populism. So what I try to do is, and it's also some of the questions that popped up as we discussed the problem with each fund, is that, well, you don't really have to look at the geopolitical context in which a given country is located. And if you look at the case of Greece and Poland, you see that the issues are absolutely different. Poland is struggling with the, uh, with the instability and war in the east. Poland is in the, on the eastern flank of NATO. Greece, on the other hand, is in the south, is war in Syria, and different uh, factors in China's impact the political scene. That's the role and position on the EU forum of each country. Because then, and this is why I have the blue boxes, and you will see that depending on the role, the history of the integration process and the degree of Euro Europeanization, you will see that the propensity of political actors to, do, to use the EU forum to bring up domestic level discourses that will be different, will change. And of course, domestic economic development play an important role because they affect or influence sensitivity or vulnerability of the society to populism and democracy. So this is an important issue. You can clearly see that both issues will play out differently and in Poland and in Greece. Then maturity of the political scene in society, this is something that the previous panel also touched upon because depending how a given political system works and how mature it is, we will see the difference in how resilient it is to uh, issues or shocks like those related to uh, migration or refugee crisis. And then you also see the ability of that system to respond to attempted uh, instrumentalization also change. Then we have also the specific point in political cycle. This is an important issue because the temporal dimension of the populism migration uh, nexus is a very important one. If there is election in sight, then there will definitely be an increased dynamic in using populist voices. There will be an increase in dynamics of instrumentalizing migration and refugee crisis for the sake of gaining greater political capital. So this is why we have here. Now, it's an important aspect of looking at the political side that the users and abusers of migration or refugee crisis is that related to information war, propaganda and deception. This is something that cannot be forgotten and I, I, will, I hope we'll be able to talk about it. And it's all related to media and how the media as an important actor handle the issue of, of populism and the vicious cycle, cycle that, that emerges. So eventually that may again constraining factors. So if you look at the populism uh, migration axis in this holistic way, it's an ecosystem. And this is exactly where the different actors step in. During the previous discussion, we already had a sort of uh, snapshot of what is happening, who does what. 
But in this particular case of Poland and Greece, you will see the different actors play their roles differently. What is really important here, is why we have this big arrow there, is that depending on the specific actor involved in the shaping of the um, migration cooperative nexus, you will need to have different policy responses, and different policy actions taken by each of the actors engaged in order to address it. Because ultimately what we want to, we want to find a way as to how to address and stop the vicious cycle. And in the case of the vicious cycle, it's a very important issue. So let me just get to the, to the details. This is the Greek political scene after the election. You all know it very well. This is the Greek political scene after the elections. When it comes to the electoral cycle, in most countries, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, the next election most probably will take place in 2019. So when it comes to the temporal dimension of the populist migration uh, uh, nexus, well, there is kind of stability. So it's also time to prepare. It's also something in the race before what Prime Minister Buhalchuk had said. Well, you know, it's important to see how the opposition uses the time it has to deal with the problem. So the interesting scene, the interesting issue related to the uh, Greek political scene, and I would like to look at from this perspective, is that when the winning party in 2015 election in Syriza, which is a leftist party, and it forms a coalition government with the independent Greeks, which is paradoxically a uh, very much, we would say, right-wing orthodox party. We have New Democracy, say Democratic Liberal Centrist Party, the River, the Kami, which is pretty much a party that's still looking for its identity, somehow leaning towards the neoliberal tradition. Communist Party, which is the most orthodox of all parties, which is like the defining element of the Greek political scene, it's not likely to change, very much embedded in the Stalinist rhetoric up until today. Uh, Pasok, or the Latin main of this, and Golden Dawn. That is the, probably um, the, um, the black sheep on the Greek political scene. And this is Poland. What you can see, oh, can't. What you can see um, in this column of the table, you can see the, start, the stance toward migration. So now the interesting story about Greece is the following. Essentially because of, the, of Greece's political position being locked economically being locked in terms of foreign policy, what it can do. There is a very clear consensus on the Greek political scene that it just simply, it's simply impossible to be against migration. And that it is impossible to use migration as a political resource. Well, there is also a very practical explanation to that. Because Greece is a receiving country, you just have to accept those people. And there are several reasons for that. But the most important, of course, is that of non refoulement no pushbacks. So it would be um, suicidal for any political party to say, well, we don't want the migrants. We don't want the refugees. So in a way, every party that considers itself to be a serious party will not use migration as a political resource. And of course, we have the cases of independent Greeks. Because part of their mandate is the issue of national pride, of national identity. So they are at a kind of unease with migration, but because of their position in the coalition as the minor partner, they can't say too much, so they don't. The problem is with Golden Dawn, and this is a very interesting case, because they've always been against migration. Initially, not necessarily related to the refugee migration crisis that hit Europe in 2015 and 16. Initially, it was about national purity, about the rights of the Greeks to live and have the space for living. Um, historical components are very important here. We might get to discuss them later on. However, what is really important about Golden Dawn is that in face of the refugee migration crisis that we have <coughs> face today, this party has been essentially silenced in the media and on the political scene. And this is something that we haven't seen uh, in the public discourse, the political discourse in the bishop of countries. And probably one of the most important lessons to draw from the example of Greece. When we look at the Polish political scene, all of you know, well, when it comes to the leading part, ruling part, law and justice, well, they are against migration. But I would like you to look at this, this graph that we have. It's very important to distinguish between the different levels of analysis. Because if you listen to the rhetoric of the government, they are very much against the relocation scheme imposed by the European Commission, this is how it's presented. If you look at the specific discussive intervention of specific members of the parliament, then the situation is different. When you look at the political parties in Greece, 
and in specific stands of uh, law and justice, then the situation is different again. So we have a maze of different discursive interventions. However, and this is very important, this is why we have civil society, NGOs and other actors, what the government is doing, they are using other means, like the church, or specific functions of the church as an institution, to influence society. And then the media outlet, so we go there, and this is how society is influenced. So it is important to distinguish the different levels in how the, uh, the government uh, uses uh, the anti migration rhetoric, so that you can address each of them. So because I've got three minutes, I go where I wanted to. Um, these are the questions that we might want to address later on. If cultural and historical factors play a role, they do. Whether ideology plays a role in shaping different kinds of stands towards migration and refugee crisis, and whether they are then more likely to use it as a political resource or not. Yes, it does, but not as much as we, as we might want to think. It's a very interesting question whether migration populist nexus can be used in a positive way. I hope that you will pick up on this. It's very interesting, particularly with also Mr. Novak, representing Novak Chesna. It's a very interesting case. But this is probably what is really important. How we address these issues and whether we have positive examples. So, there's tremendous work done by civil society actors in Poland. And then we have Mr. Kuharczyk representing the, uh, this tremendous investment has been done recently. In Greece, we see containment mostly of, uh, of going down and silencing. And this is static consensus that we need to create the democratic calculus because it's the only way to go. For several reasons. But there are several outstanding problems that will be exacerbated the moment the political cycle gets more dynamic. And we go to the first slide over right here. So this is something we might want to discuss again. And this is um, what we might want to do in the future. So at the conceptual level, I leave it. There's an important difference between populism and demagogy, and it's important not to confuse the two terms. And it's particularly important that in demagogy you essentially do not use uh, a specific term or specific problem as a political resource because there's no particular game inside in it immediately. At the empirical level, I would like to draw your attention to the great or enormous work done by the Polish universities that in many instances, particularly in Central Europe, in Warsaw, in Katowice, in Krakow, are very much against what is happening in Poland, and enormous effort is done to educate the young people. I think this example of successful projects, one of the projects run also by Warsaw School of Economics, where young people were brought to Greece, and this is what they said. At first we thought migration was not our problem at all, we are not interested in going to Athens at all. Once we went there, we realized how the Greeks were dealing with that problem. We realized that it matters, that it's an important issue for us as well. And these were not people that were from the, let's say, left side of the political spectrum. So I would say there is a lot of potential there, and the, the, the next two years leading up to the next elections can be used in a very positive and constructive way. And then at the political level, what I would see that needs to be done at the Polish political scene is to build something that is democratic calculus above all the devices that we have. I know that the, Greek, uh, that, that the Polish government is not the easiest partner to masterpiece this kind of calculus. But without it, we are only experience, we as, as Poland, we are only experience negative implications. One of them being, for instance, um, the, um, the negative impact of the migration debate and the um, losses of the image that Poland incurs at the EU level, because of taking the migration debate to the EU level rather than solving it at home. And so it goes. So there is a lot of food for thought, I hope. And I'll just stop here and uh, leaving the floor to, to the rest of the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, since we are a little bit behind time, without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Anna Huaka Gutikova from Slovakia, who will address uh, the question also particularly from, from a Slovak perspective. Thank you, Sina, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me and for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be in Budapest again. Um, first of all, I have a background in social psychology, I'm not, not in political sciences, so I hope I'm not going to be too off topics. If I am, so just bear with me, please. Um, as to the migration issue in Slovakia, it's um, it's something that uh, really emerged in 2015. Before 
I work in this in this field for about seven years, and migration was never an issue. It was a known topic. Uh, we used to work on the local level with municipalities, and the the response was that um, we are creating this issue. That we are talking about something that is non-existent, and even um, uh, it was it was not a source of conflict. But uh, in 2015, even in the, in the Eurobarometer polls, in May 2015, only 4% of the Slovak population thought that uh, migration was something of a concern. Uh, with with uh, the increasing number of refugees coming to Europe, um, <laughs> And with with the national elections coming up in Slovakia in, in 2016, that was something that coincided, and it was something that uh, I say that nothing better could happen to political parties in Slovakia at that time, because um, using different minorities or you know, scapegoating is not a new new strategy of campaign in Slovakia. We always had. Somebody. First, it was Hungarians that, that were used as, as a scapegoat. Uh, then uh, it was Roma. Usually, it was Roma. Uh, but I think both both these groups, and then it was LGBTI, obviously. Uh, but both these these groups, Roma, are old news basically. Refugees. Um, with, with, the, with the extent of the crisis, we're able to, um, to, to uh, create such passionate response in society, even, in, um, even though it's, I think, if it wasn't for the, for the election campaign, it wouldn't be so bad. Um, there was a, an opinion poll uh, conducted in September 2015 uh, that surveyed the perception of the population and um, and how they how they saw how they felt about migration about refugees. There were three issues or main topics that were identified. Basically, uh, people associated migration with security threat. Uh, then they saw no room for diversity, and also they thought that the, we as a country had nothing to offer, that we ourselves needed help. So this is understandable. But what was interesting that um, almost 40% of, of the population um, were sort of uncertain how to how to um, how to approach this topic, how to how to handle it. And they also said that they didn't have enough information and that the only information they had was from the media and they didn't seek for information actively. So it was really, really up to the political elites how they approached this topic and how they handled it. And with the coming elections and with knowing that this type of um, Mm, this type of scape scapegoating worked before. Obviously, they they approached it in a way that is uh, common in in the big four region. And I'm not going to talk a lot about different strategies because, as has already been said, um, the play is pretty pretty common to to all countries. Mm, just. Just uh, to give you an idea, they used a lot of other being discourse, uh, highlighting the contrast between us and them, uh, between us Christians and them uh, Muslims. Um, they used a lot of uh, dehumanization, dehumanization um, rhetorics by using by using uh, quantitative like mass waves and. Uh, in floods, flood, uh, so, so they took refugees and migrants out of the realm of humanity, so it is easier to, to, to refuse them, to shut the door. 
and even the a strategy of pointing out that Slovakia or Czechoslovakia was once a country, a sending country that produced refugees in the previous decades. Um, that was initially used as something to, to elicit uh, com compassion and solidarity. That was turned and used again as, as something just to point out that we are the good ones because we um, we went to Germany, to Switzerland and other countries and we behaved, to put it bluntly, um, we adjusted, we, we integrated, but these Muslims, they are not going to integrate. They are completely different from us, they are worse than us. So it was again used um, to, to derogate refugees and migrants. Um, so in March 2016, uh, we had national elections and what happened after the elections, uh, it was quiet on the migration front. Um, nobody was talking about, about migration anymore, even though in, uh, in January the Prime Minister of the ruling party said they would have uh, three press conferences a week just to talk about security threat uh, posed by migrants. Uh, they, would, uh, they would present new state-of-the-art mobile border fence uh, just to show that we are going to protect you. Uh, they would visit uh, refugee camps in Macedonia just to show how unruly refugees are and that we are going to protect you. Uh, but coming with, with, uh, with the elections, actually this strategy didn't work for SNAP, for the ruling party. Uh, they still won, but compared to the election in 2012, they lost um, about 12% or so. So, to me it was it was obvious to people that this was a strategy used to cover up uh, their huge corruption scandals. So people sort of saw they didn't believe them. They, they felt it was not genuine. But this strategy worked for other parties. Uh, People's Party or Slovakia, which is a far-right extremist party and so the National Party, which is Nationalist Party. And um, both these parties, the first one, the People's Party, are selected, they, they first, first time they, they uh, reached the quorum and they, they, uh, they got elected into the parliament, they got 8% of the votes, which is unprecedented. And they built on this uh, image of um, corruption-free party and solar national party roughly the same. But uh, still there, there is something why this, why this strategy worked. <laughs> and um, obviously the ethnocentrism is there, there's no question about it, but, but we think in our institute we think there's something else and that's, uh, that's connected to, with the um, with the changing world and how people are unable to sort of cope with it. And there's a, there's a theory from intercultural psychology called uh, cultural shock theory, which is applied to the migration and to how migrants cope with coming to a new country, a new whole society. And it has four stages. First stage is called honeymoon, so everything is great. We love the country. We are eager to explore it. Uh, second stage is it's getting too much, it's too much changes, and I just want to sort of uh, re retract myself to escape. Uh, third stage is adaptation, so I'm um, looking for ways how to how to balance uh, different identities. And the fourth stage is uh, is um, is uh, the final one, the integration. So we think that 
our societies are going through these stages with respect to changing world, to globalization. And uh, at first we were honeymooning and the technologies were great, the economic uh, development was great, we joined the EU, everything was amazing, Slovakia was called the Central European Tiger, we were just uh, progressing very quickly. But now it's, um, and migration is one of the things that is getting too much for people and they don't know how to cope with it. So, so all these populist and nationalist parties are giving them uh, something that they know and they, they feel secure. The nation, uh, Christianity, <coughs> um, close borders, they, they give them the sense of uh, security that, that they can keep them in the reality that they know and they, they can navigate. So this is something that, that uh, we think is going on and it's not based in research. We've done a lot of discussions across Slovakia, a lot of focus groups, focus on different things, but this is something that is, uh, that is emerging. Mm. And I think I have to finish, so I'll finish. <laughs> and maybe I'll get to the rest in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for um, this review of the uh, Slovak situation, especially before the elections. And I find it particularly interesting that you raise this cultural uh, shift here. So I think we will come back to this uh, in the discussion. Now I would like to give the floor to uh, Marta Pardavi, who is co-president of the Hungarian Housing Committee, one of the NGOs which have been very active in responding to the uh, refugee and migration crisis over the past two years and which has been under uh, attack by the Hungarian government for doing so. So uh, Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I, I feel a little bit like the other one because I'm, I'm not a researcher, I'm not a scholar, I'm not leading a human rights NGO, and so I don't have a sort of systemic, scientific, very well-grounded um, presentation to give to you. What I'd like to offer is maybe some thoughts, and I'm sure my colleague Wunchu, who is working for a think tank, will be able to give the, the, the background and, and um, put that into perspective. Actually, many of the things that have been mentioned from Poland and, and from Slovakia are exactly the same things, but we always tend to think of the Visegrad region as uh, having uh, a sort of a more or less unified approach to migration and the response to the refugee crisis is in general horrible everywhere and we're all the same. This is certainly not true when you start to scratch the surface, and I think what we've heard here is already illustrating that. What I noted is that there is, as always, of course, a Hungarian way, um, and we we do we outdo our brothers and sisters in the region in many of the bad things, and there are things which um, which uh, are very specific to Hungary. Obviously, that's because of the politics; it's not because necessarily of the very vast difference in the popular uh, sentiment. Similarly, as in Slovakia, asylum was a very long and odd issue in Hungary. This is something that we always struggled with as a human rights organization that also works on refugee protection. No one being really interested in what we do um, are highly uh, and increasingly sophisticated legal expertise being well recognized outside of Hungary and European um, debates, but not being necessarily of any use in Hungary whatsoever because this was such a side or a non-issue. And then all of a sudden you wake up in January 2015 and you find that migration is the number one issue and it still is in Hungary. Or it is one of the, the number one issues. So this I think caught a lot of uh, actors in society completely unaware and unprepared and we were also a little bit unprepared for this. But the reason why the Hungarian popular um, perception about asylum, about migration, about this whole issue in general is so twisted. It's partly because there was no information out there. So if 
we would be able to identify any of the future threats that could be, or issues that could be scapegoated. I think one thing to prevent this very sudden slide is to be much better informed. What we saw in January 2015, right after the Shadi Abdo attacks in Paris, um, was a Hungarian Prime Minister pinpointing migration as the number one threat to Europe, both as a security and also as a cultural and identity threat. And no one in the Hungarian media really knew what this was about. There was complete um, confusion and a lack of information about the difference between refugees and migrants, about how the European Union asylum policy has been developing, what are the instruments. There is much better knowledge. Now everybody's an expert on the Dublin rules in Hungary, but in January 2015, this was nowhere in size. And so I think if, if we really want to think of how to counter populist trends, obviously facts are not the exclusive answer, but one thing to do is to identify based on already existing worrying trends and examples, what are the blind spots and how we can already in advance of that prepare ourselves. So there was no knowledge of this in the Hungarian public. Whatever people uh, understood came from politicians and the media. And the media was also so badly uninformed that they basically took whatever was told to them by the Prime Minister and the very savvy spin doctors as granted. So who was there to counter this? Who was there to say that no, this is complete falsity, it's not true that all the refugees who come to Hungary are exclusively economic migrants? Very few people were there. One of them was the NGOs that have been working on, on uh, refugee protection issues. There were some researchers and some polit politicians, but I'd rather say individuals rather than political parties. So what you were talking about is making, a, creating some sort of counter narrative for a political party that would politically benefit that party by distinguishing it from the mainstream or the the dominant discourse, this was not happening, and I think it's fairly missing today, too. So this was a wonderful way, a, a moment, in fact, for the Orban government to achieve a lot of domestic and European Union objectives. One of their domestic objectives in early 2015 was to divert attention away from growing unease and, and popular discontent with corruption there were several very um, well-reported rape cases of corruption and the political consequences of that it happening in the fall of 2014. This was becoming increasingly uncomfortable for the government, and it also lost in by-election some seats. So the supermajority that Fidesz has in, Hung in the Hungarian parliament that enables it to basically disregard parliamentary procedures and parliamentary democracy. Um, it, it's such an important sort of tool for it that, that uh, I think migration was identified as a good way to divert attention away from this worrying and popular discontent. Um, to thematize the narrative, the political discourse in Hungary with, as I said, sort of uh, on, a, on an issue that has not really been exposed before, and so there was a lot of information and messaging that the government and the, the, the media landscape, which is has at, already at that time was very distorted, was ripe to soak up these these sort of uh, fake news or distorted pieces of information, and there was no real counter narratives um, so widely available to the public. So this was, this was, I guess, the mostly the domestic objective. Um, it was used to build more support for the government, locally, popular voters' support. But also it had, I think, a very strong regional and European objective, which still exists very much today. And in that sense, um, I can't really assess how successful it has been, truly, genuinely, but certainly on the superficial level, it seems that it has been a working strategy for Mr. Orban. The, the Hungarian government, through, through its um, systemic uh, 
steps and measures taken to basically weaken the rule of law in Hungary had by that time in early 2015 become more or less of a part of a country in the EU, at least politically. And that still exists, I think, today. You don't see high level EU officials or, or important EU member states coming to Hungary, but this was certainly a, a big objective to get back on the scene in a way that um, would lend more of an authority or, or more of a more 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 power to to Hungary and European policy debates than what would normally be um, uh, the the role that Hungary had played. And one way to achieve that was to pinpoint a, an existing problem, which is how ineffective the European policy on creating a, a common European asylum system has been. Obviously for Hungary and for many of the countries from the V4 region, the Dublin system is an extremely important, really important um, issue. Uh, the Dublin system is very unfair. That was visible already in, um, in the Italian and the Greek case. But as the refugee flows started really increasing, it became more and more evident that, that the way the Dublin system which determines which EU member state has to, to deter, look at an asylum claim works is unfair in the frontline countries. And since Hungary on the Balkan route was one of the EU frontline countries, this was utterly unfair. And the Hungarian government, I think, was able to exploit the unfairness and the, and the lack of an effective creative response to, to this issue in the EU to the full extent possible, to rally support among many other uh, friendly governments, not only in the Visegrad region but elsewhere. And today, I think we see the Hungarian government, at least in the migration debate at the EU level, having far more weight than in many other policy areas. And this was through identifying migration as, as a way in, as a wedge. Now, there's a lot of things that I won't have time to talk about, and I hope would you would. But uh, one thing I, I thought of mentioning is how this affected the civil society sector. Um, not the whole sector in general, but certainly cert uh, many, many NGOs which have been working on refugee issues, refugee protection, either from a legal perspective as the LGBT community, or from a social integration perspective, actually um, saw that there was a far, far more attention on the work political attention too, with all its unwanted uh, consequences, but also a lot more popular support. We've been, and that's a positive consequence, we've been able to feel that there is, in fact, a lot of people who are willing to support refugees and to go out in the streets and help people if they get an opportunity to do so, as long as refugees are kept in detention centers away from, from public access, basically. There is no way for the public, for individuals, to feel that they can do something. But once an opportunity arose in the summer of 2015, thousands and thousands of people were mobilized in Hungary. And this was not only to help refugees, but to express very sincere discontent with how the Hungarian government was approaching this. And you had people of all sorts of political, uh, affiliations and approaches coming from a variety uh, of, of popular or, or um, yeah, popular societal strata come going out and working together. So it was a, in a, a very heartwarming moment and also promising momentum. Question is whether once the refugees are no longer there to, help, to be helped, what do you do with that momentum? But the other aspect was also how the refugee crisis also uh, rallied many other NGOs and very prominent uh, leading NGOs to, to um, start speaking about more general human rights aspects. And this culminated in last summer when the Hungarian government ran a campaign uh, leading up to the national referendum on October 2nd on what was called the minor quotas, which was the the not the first and not the last of very many aggressive campaigns that um, were government funded basically against um, um, refugees and, and, and solidarity. And, uh, and many NGOs came together, both looking at the way the referendum campaign was held 
to rally for actual um, for for supporting an actual political position, which is typically not something Hungarian NGOs would do. The NGO sector, by and large, start, makes every effort to stay away from politics because of what was discussed in the first panel, which was just said about the, the sort of contagious um, uh, perception of it. But we came together in a campaign to call for all people to go participate in the referendum and to pass an invalid vote. And that was, I think, the farthest, the most political action that we've ever taken. There is um, the consequences of that now with the very harsh NGO attacks by the Hungarian government, particularly on, on the Helsinki Committee, but many others which says that uh, NGOs should basically stay out of public affairs. It's almost a typical um, message where NGOs are, are allowed to provide services, but you cannot do advocacy because that's the realm of politics and you're not an elected representative and therefore you shouldn't be speaking about politics altogether. So this, of course, also mobilized the NGOs in this sense. It was, I think, uh, a good, um, tax run for something that is more political engagement, not necessarily with party politics, but in general taking part in a political debate and, and choosing a side. Um, yes, I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marika. Um, okay, I don't know what's happening. Uh, you have two microphones. Switch it off for a second. Switch it off for a second. Okay, so let's try now. Uh, actually, I think I will just pass the floor to Bucho. Certainly, there will be a, um, a few overlappings with what uh, Marta has said, um, um, but I hope I also can contribute to the uh, uh, discussion with some of your thoughts. So this is just a, a first and basic uh, table, uh, just for you to have an idea about the numbers of refugees um, arrived in Hungary in, in, in different years. You can see that 2015, of course, um, was um, an exceptional. Uh, year for, for Hungary, um, and um, based on the size of the population, Hungary received the most um, asylum applications within the European Union after Sweden. So it was really a, a huge challenge um, for, for the country. And of course, you can then also see um, after the um, strict rules on, on um, migration, um, how the number has, uh, has changed. 
um, in the following years after 2015. Um, now this is um, a, a graph about the daily arrivals of refugees to Hungary, asylum seekers to Hungary. Uh, in 2015, it's only 2015, uh, I would like to divert your attention um, to a couple of uh, moments in um, within this year. As Marta has mentioned already, um, actually the anti-immigration rhetoric of the government started out in the beginning of January, although there were um, a couple of attempts already uh, in the second half of 2014 by, by government um, officials, uh, mainly by uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban to, to put this topic on the agenda. But, um, uh, we'll talk about this later, but the full speed actually uh, started in, in January 2015. Now you can see how many um, asylum seekers arrived to Hungary at that time. In January 2015, it was um, the daily rate was um, around a few um, hundreds, probably. But of course, it's not comparable with the with the numbers um, who arrived during the summer. And actually, the um, the big um, flow of, fresh, of uh, asylum seekers arrived in Hungary um, in June. At, Beginning of June or middle of June, you can see how the rise, uh, how the numbers um, and has increased um, after this time. Um, at the beginning of the year, it were mainly um, asylum seekers from the Balkans, from the Western Balkans, and mainly from um, Kosovo um, who came to Hungary. And of course, later in the year, it were mainly um, uh, asylum seekers from the Middle East who, who came to Hungary. Um, and this is the point of time when the Hungarian southern border was completely shut down um, by the um, fence in, uh, at the border to Serbia and the border to Croatia. And here you can see the um, evaluation of the government's performance, um, the, the, the tendency of this. And um, here what I would like to point your attention is, is the time of 2014, second half of 2014, which actually Marta has already mentioned. At that time, the Hungarian government was in a deep crisis due to a lot of um, uh, uh, issues, a lot of corruption scandals, internal fightings within the government. Um, and the anti immigration rhetoric was started actually already in the, like in the, in the uh, last quarter of 2014. In October, November, and December, there have already been a few attempts by, by Prime Minister Viktor Orban to put this topic on the agenda. There were a, a few interviews uh, where he mentioned uh, this topic, but, um, but the real um, kind of campaign started out, as Marta said, right after the Charlie Hebdo attack. It was in January um, the 8th, um, and explicitly in Paris he said that uh, Migration has to be stopped because of the um, um, concerns over um, about terrorism. Um, so, I think this graph shows you that um, um, to utilize a topic, the Hungarian government had solely domestic political reasons, um, and that's why um, they chose this topic. Um, and they also, until today, and probably after the, uh, the elections in 2018, this topic will remain on the agenda in Hungary. Um, and actually, to understand the situation in Hungary, you have to be a bit of aware of um, how the Hungarian government is able to control the public discourse in the country. Um, and actually, I really cannot count anymore how many waves of anti-immigration campaign uh, we had in Hungary. Since January 2015, it started out with the, with the National Consultation on Immigration and Terrorism. I think the, um, this, um, the headline um, tells already everything, how the Hungarian government framed the whole story. Uh, then we had a few um, debates of billboard campaigns again, um, across the country. Another national consultation recently with the headline, Let's Stop Brussels. Um, I just, for you to kind of have an impression of the scale of this campaign, um, this is um, well an, an actually a, a, a normal um, scene in Hungary where you can see like a couple of billboards uh, besides each other in the same street. So, um, and of course, 
what uh, contributes to this picture is also the, the, the media landscape in Hungary. Most of the um, um, uh, media with national outreach are either direct or indirect controlled by the government. So um, I think it's pretty important to understand how the Hungarian government was able to, um, um, to spread uh, its message um, uh, to the whole population with this uh, um, massive scale. Um, and how this anti-immigration rhetoric affected the social perception um, you can see here on, on, on this chart. Um, actually, the Hungarian government has been traditionally pretty much xenophobic um, against uh, uh, different um, sorts of, of minorities. Um, the most hated group is actually the Roma, uh, but there's also a certain level of, um, of um, anti-Semitism in the country, um, um, and sentiments against um, LGBTQ people and so on and so forth. But what I uh, would like to show you here is the, um, the level of xenophobic sentiments and, and the tendency how it developed throughout the years. Um, and you can, as Mark and, and, and I told, um, the, the campaign in, in, full, in its full speed started in, in January 2015. And already by April 2015, xenophobic sentiments um, had increased a lot. And the interesting case, what also Mark actually had, has mentioned, um, is that um, as I mentioned, the, um, the big flow of refugees arrived to Hungary in, um, in June 2015, and you can see that after um, many asylum seekers arrived to Hungary and, and, um, and people were really faced with, this, with their situation, um, besides what Marcia, Ma Marta has mentioned, there was a huge um, amount of solidarity or a huge show of solidarity many people. Uh, went to the streets, went to the train stations to, to help them. Um, so, and, and as they were kind of faced with, with the practical situation, um, xenophobic sentiments decreased. Um, I think it's uh, actually a good sign um, that um, the Hungarian government's um, campaign of propaganda um, has its limits. But after um, the borders were shut down and the campaign was uh, full in speed again, uh, xenophobic sentiments um, has, has, have, have increased again. And it's actually, it's, um, it's still going on. And here what I wanted to show you how immigration was perceived as um, um, one of the most important topics in the country. Um, in, two, in um, November 2014, it already increased, and what I would like to point is um, the, the date of October 2016, where we had the uh, referendum in Hungary, and you can see that terrorism has remained one of the most important topics among, um, uh, for, in the eyes of the population, although since actually the second half of 2015, since October 2015, not so much asylum seekers. Um, arrive to Hungary and, not, uh, and they're not really present in the country. Um, so very quickly, I have two slides more. Um, how it impacted the political language, I think it's, it's rather uh, common in our region, uh, in every country. Uh, the re rhetoric and the campaign of, of the government had all elements of um, a toolkit, a rhetorical toolkit, which is a, um, actually, um, characteristics of far right rhetoric in, in Western European countries, fear mongering. Um, instead of refugees, of course, they use the term illegal immigrants or illegal migrants. Um, Securitization of the terrorists are migrants. Um, uh, cultural and religious aspects like Christian Europe will be conquered by my, my Muslim immigrants. And it's not a far right party which is, which is uh, telling that in Hungary, but it's a governing party. Um, of course, your skeptic element, the conspiracy element, um, which um, actually or, uh, already relates to the attacks on NGOs, as Marta said, that migration is organized by, um, among others, by George Soros, who finances a lot of organizations in Hungary. Um, and there's also, which is, I think is very important, is the anti establishment elements. Like Prime Minister Viktor Orban is one of the few kind of mainstream leaders within the European Union who dares to say the truth, which um, other leaders of the EU don't um, dare to say to the European people. Um, and so, the last slide. 
uh, what is the rationale behind it, why, why um, the hunger environment is doing this. We've already talked about polarization, of course, it's not a it's not a new thing. The Hungarian government has been applying this strategy actually since 2002, but I think um, it, um, it, it has become really um, striking um, due to the, um, the anti-immigration rhetoric of the, of the government. So why, what are the objectives of the government? Marta actually has mentioned already um, um, a, a few of them. I think the main objective is uh, not only to Divert attention from bad governance and from corruption scandals, of course, which are also very important. Um, but I think, um, and of course, they want to um, 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 cover the political agenda, or they want to um, have a lead on the po on on, uh, on uh, setting the political agenda. And also, of course, there is a competition between Fidesz and the far right party in Hungary. That's all true. But I think. The, Main objective of, of the government was to create a new dichotomy within uh, within the society um, and to kind of change the old left and right division with this new one with the, with the patriots versus the enemies of the nation. And every every each topic actually since since that time has been fra framed within this uh, within this narrative. Uh, and of course, every topic is related um, um, to the topic of uh, migration by the government. Um, and I. And also, um, as I mentioned, pre um, um, attacks on NGOs, for instance, attacks on, um, on media, um, are also um, related to this topic in the sense that um, the government wants to discredit any kind of independent and critical voice um, and eliminate these um, by um, 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 closing them or by um, excluding them from the nation and, and labeling them as enemies of the nation. Um, and there's, um, I think, another aspect which is, which is pretty interesting and pretty important is the uh, regional or international aspect. Um, I think the Hungarian government um, um, played on the card that um, Orban, Viktor Orban very much hoped that the political landscape within the European Union will be transformed. He clearly said in an interview in the beginning of two, in, in 2017 that this year will be a year of, of, of revolt um, in, in the world, not only in Europe actually. Um, so he, he very much hoped for a populist revolt, um, that uh, populist parties um, in France, in the Netherlands, in Germany um, will gain power. Um, so he very much hoped that he's, he, he, he's going to be able to transform the political landscape which would help them to secure his domestic.